Okay. Okay. Frank, can you can you see the slides? Yeah, yeah, we can see you see the slides here. You perfectly fine. So, uh, thank okay, you very much. Right. We'll have the last talk uh, of this uh, two week long workshop uh, <laughs> by uh, Bryn Mar Haskell on the gravitational waves from isolated neutron stars. Thank you very much, Bryn. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Tog, and all the organizers for putting this together and uh, for inviting me. Um, so. I've been asked to talk about gravitational waves from isolated neutron stars, so I'll follow on a little bit from where Kai left things. And I think you know, Kai already gave a very good introduction to, to this, so really, really discussed why we're interested in probing neutron stars with gravitational waves. And you know, just to go over it once more, uh, the issue really is that we want to use neutron stars as laboratories to, to probe dense matter. And we want to probe it in a regime that's actually quite different from the ones uh, that we can probe with terrestrial experiments. So the reason is that neutron stars are not only very dense, but, you know, Kai already said this, they're also cold objects. So you know, despite temperatures that you know, sound quite high, when you really look at the thermal energy, this is quite small compared to, to the Fermi energy of the, of the constituents. And so that they behave as, as cold objects. And we heard some of this in the, the previous uh, sessions. This leads to interesting phenomena such as uh, superfluidity that uh, Erbil already discussed in detail last time. And so we end up being able to probe this high density, low temperature region of the QCD phase diagram, which is one we really don't know much about because we can't do uh, sort of first principles calculations and also you know, experiments like accelerators or heavy ion colliders really probe the, the more high temperature uh, region and so we can study things like quark gluon plasmas but uh, to really know what's happening at these high densities we need neutron stars. Kai already discussed a little bit of what the options could be at asymptotically high uh, densities where you can get different kinds of pairing for the parks, but really at these intermediate densities, we, we just don't know what uh, what nature actually does. And so this is what we want to probe with uh, neutron star observations. And to do this, of course, we, we've heard the, during this workshop, there are many different ways of observing neutron stars. So they pop up throughout the, the electromagnetic spectrum. So we, in the radio, we study radio pulsars and in the x-ray and we can see accreting sources and we obviously in gamma rays ultraviolet also optical but again the electromagnetic radiation in general is reprocessed by, by the outer layers of the neutron star so really we can't get a clean imprint of what's happening in the interior which is what we can do with gravitational waves. As gravitational waves interact only very weakly with matter, and you know, that, that's why they're so hard to detect. And that's why one has to uh, go to build these very sophisticated instruments such as LIGO and, and Virgo to, to actually detect the signals. And they will therefore carry a much cleaner imprint of what's happening in these really high density regions in the interior that are the ones uh, that we want to study. And Kai's already said quite a lot about what you can do uh, with, uh, with mergers and how you can start ready to put constraints on the equation of state of uh, dense matter. And so he's talked about the, these, uh, let's say, chirp signals. So here I'll classify the signals uh, a little bit in terms of uh, the kind of um, the way that they're observed, so the kind of techniques that. Uh, are used to go after them in, in gravitational wave data. So Kai discussed compact binary in spirals. So these give you this characteristic uh, chirp signal that grows in, in frequency and amplitude and then disappears once the stars have merged. And this is, is what we've detected. So we've detected many compact binary in spirals, some of them involving neutron stars. What I really want to discuss now is a different kind of signal that has not been detected yet. And so these are continuous gravitational wave signals. 
So then let's say the gravitational wave equivalent of, of a pulsar. So you have a signal that's on basically all the time. So this could be due, and, and we'll see this in a second, to uh, deformation on the neutron star that makes it kind of like a gravitational wave pulsar, but it could also be due to modes of oscillation in the star. So you could uh, think of doing gravitational wave astroseismology with continuous waves. And I'll touch a little bit also on a different kind of signal. So what are known as, as gravitational wave bursts. So these are sort of unmodeled uh, bursts of, of gravitational waves. You could have such things, for example, with the following supernova or, or due to magnetar flares or even uh, pulsar glitches. And of course, the, the, the distinction between the two is not uh, so strict because uh, you know, when we think of continuous wave, we think of a signal that's on all the time. In practice, you could have long-lived modes that are then damped, so you could have, you know, let's say, short continuous signals, or you could have long um, bursts. So these are the kind of phenomena I'll discuss. And of course, the, the, there's also different kinds of signals, uh, for example, stochastic signals that could have cosmological origin, but I won't be talking about this today. So. The mechanisms I'll be focusing on mainly for isolating neutron stars are two. So the, the one that you know, we most commonly talk about when we talk about continuous waves is uh, uh, that's due to what, what we call a mountain on a neutron star. So what, what this means is uh, actually a non axisymmetric deformation of the star. So if you look at the, at the picture, if you think of a sort of constant density star, a bit like a rugby ball, and you deform it, you have some triaxial ellipsoid, and then it's rotating around the, the z-axis. You see, you, you build a, a time-varying quadrupole, so the star has a, a quadrupole, and then it's, it varies as the star rotates. And this leads to, to gravitational wave emission. And usually this is, is quantified in, in terms of this uh, ellipticity that I define here. So essentially the normalized uh, difference between the uh, principal axis of the moment of inertia. And then, you know, in this standard mechanism, you would have gravitational wave emission of twice the rotation frequency of the stars. This is uh, quadrupolar emission. You, you can think also of other scenarios, for example, if you have a, a neutron star that's deformed by the magnetic field, and this is inclined with respect to the rotation axis, or if you have precession, etc., you can also have uh, emission at the rotation frequency of the star. Then, as I said, another mechanism for gravitational wave emission could be modes of oscillation. So if the fluid is oscillating, then oscillation, so the density and pressure will couple uh, to the gravitational field and again, lead to the gravitational wave emission. And in this case, the emission will be at the, the frequency of the mode that's being excited. And the main candidates uh, really for searches are uh, the F mode, so this is basically the, the fundamental mode, so it's a shape mode of, of the star, and the R mode, which is a toroidal mode of oscillation for which the restoring force is a Coriolis force, so it's like Rossby waves in, in the ocean. And you know, these are the main candidates for several reasons. On one side, there are mechanisms, and we'll discuss them in a second, that would allow them to be actually excited. And the other, you know, the, the many other modes of oscillation in, in a star, but these ones for the pulsar population would actually give uh, emission that's in the frequency range that we can detect with, with ground-based interferometers. So, okay, there you have a little animation. I want to review these mechanisms uh, and discuss you know, their, their impact on the different phases of the neutron star's life. So I really do want to start off where, where Kai left. So from uh, a merger remnant, so it's been, mergers have been discussed as the end of a neutron star's life up to now. But if we sort of take a more circular view of existence, we can actually start thinking this as a instead of the formation of a new neutron star, because if you merge the two objects, um, then of course, if the mass binary is very high, you will create a black hole, but you can also create uh, a metastable object. You could, well, if the masses are low enough, you could create a stable neutron star, or you could 
create neutron star that's supported by, by rapid rotation and eventually collapse is to a black hole. But uh, the signal itself from this remnant can be very interesting because one can uh, excite you know, during, during the process of the merger, then modes of oscillation of the merger. And uh, for example, simulations have shown that you can excite the, the F mode. And uh, this would be very interesting to, to study because the uh, um, relations, if we manage to measure the frequency and the damping time scale uh, of the modes, and this can tell us something about the uh, matter in the star. There are simple relations that tie the frequency and the damping time scale to the mass and radius uh, of the object. And then one can think also of doing more and understand things such as viscosity, etc., as Kai uh, discussed. And of course, there have been searches already for uh, the, the signals from uh, merger remnants. At the moment, the, we don't quite have the sensitivity at these uh, higher frequencies, but the, this, of course, would be very interesting to detect. And one can also uh, think of gravitational waves in the context of uh, millisecond magnetar. So we heard an interesting talk uh, just now by Sinem where she was talking about the, the evolution of the star. Uh, so we looked at this a little bit recently with my student, Tan Kan Sur. And um, the idea here is that the, the evolution can also be driven by, by gravitational waves. And the way this would work is that if you have fallback accretion on to a strongly magnetized object, then the magnetic field can confine from this accreted matter and you can create uh, a little mountain. So you can create a quadrupole on the star that again leads to a signal and you see an example of the kind of gravitational waves you expect on the plot on the right. Uh, and so again, this would be one of these, let's say long bursts of gravitational radiation, the signal would last for a certain amount of time as the star evolves, but then eventually uh, it collapses to a black hole, it's, it's cut off. And this is maybe too weak for current detectors, but it could be used with future gravitational wave detectors to test this kind of scenario. Okay, so if we move on with the life of a neutron star, let's now move on from these you know, very first instants after uh, the birth of uh, the star to when we have an actual uh, neutron star and gravitational waves can play again a role if we think of objects that are a few kilo years old in actually spinning down the, the newly born hot and rapidly rotating neutron star and taking it down to the kind of periods that are observed in uh, kind of frequencies that are observed in the current in the standard pulsar population. And in fact, it's been suggested that gravitational waves due to R modes uh, play a role in doing this. So to discuss it, I need to go into a little bit more detail as to what uh, the R mode is. So as I said, these are toroidal mode of oscillate, modes of oscillation that exist in a rotating star because uh, the restoring force is a Coriolis force. And they're interesting uh, because they can actually be driven unstable by gravitational wave emission. So as you emit gravitational waves, this can actually lead to the mode growing in amplitude and to stronger gravitational wave emission. And the way this works in a very sort of hand wavy fashion is if you look at the, the plots here on the, on the left, the, these are animations by Ben Owen. If you have a counter rotating mode, so if you're sitting on the star, so it's, uh, you're a rotating observer and you see a counter moving mode, so you have a mode with negative angular momentum, and then this couples to gravitational wave emission, and you wanna see what's, you know, what, how much angular momentum is being carried away, what's happening at infinity, then you know, if you move to the inertial frame, now actually your mode pattern is being dragged in the other direction by the rotation of the star. So you look at infinity, you're removing angular momentum, you're making, so you're making the angular momentum even more negative in the rotating frame. So you're, you're driving the mode. Uh, 
So that's a hand wavy way of seeing it. So in practice, what's happening is that the system can find a configuration with lower energy and angular momentum, and it sort of can transition to it thanks to the, the energy and angular momentum that are being removed by gravitational waves. So it's a bit like, you know, with, with ellipsoids where you can find the more stable configuration by thanks to viscosity, right? And so if you have uh, this instability, you potentially grow the mode to large amplitudes. You have emission at roughly four thirds the rotation frequency of the star. And there, there can be corrections due to general relativity and rapid rotation for this. And the main point here though, is that the mode will only grow as long as gravitational waves can drive it faster than viscosity can damp it. And this actually only happens you know, in a window of temperatures and frequencies. So usually this is discussed in terms of this instability window. So what you have here is on the x-axis, you have the core temperature. And on the y-axis, this is uh, the, the rotation frequency. It's, it's scaled to an estimate of the breakup frequency. And then you have this window. So the shaded regions are the ones where viscosity is damping the mode. And you see it at higher temperatures, and, and this is just for a standard neutron star model. So here I just have neutrons, protons, electrons, maybe muons, but you know, not considering any uh, exotic phases in, in the core at the moment. And so for this kind of, let's say, plain vanilla neutron star model, at high temperatures, it's mainly bulk viscosity. So due to standard, say, modified Urca reactions, it's damping the mode. At lower temperatures, it's shear viscosity. So this can just be due to electron-electron scattering mostly. Uh, but you can also have Ekman rubbing at the cross core interface playing a role. And then you have this, so you have this white region in between, which is where uh, you can actually drive the mode unstable. So what, you know, what would a, how would a neutron star actually evolve in this, in this plane? Well, uh, if we look at young neutron stars, they will come in from the right. So they will come in from a higher temperature high rotation um, area of the, of the diagram. And so here I'm, I'm showing this with some plots uh, from a nice paper by uh, Mark Alford and, and Kai in, in 2014. So what you see is that you have your young hot neutron star that comes in from the right as it's cooling. And at some point it hits uh, the instability window. So it gets into the region where the mode is unstable. So it grows. And eventually at some point, you know, the, you have heating as the shear from the unstable mode. At some point, heating will equal cooling and the star will just spin down due to gravitational wave emission. And the curve it'll follow depends on the amplitude of the modes on the saturation amplitude, this alpha, which is how large the mode can grow before things like say nonlinear couplings to other modes will stop the growth. And then you spin down and eventually the system hits the, the minimum of the curve again and re-enters the stable region. And what's interesting is that, you know, independently of, you see here, what the saturation amplitude actually was or where you entered the instability window, the system's exit close to the minimum of the curve where it's quite flat. And so eventually they, they, they end up in a rather narrow range of, of frequencies which correspond less to the ones that are observed in, the current uh, pulsar population. And so if you, another way of looking at this, if you look at the Granger on the right, this is a uh, frequency, frequency derivative plane. You see you have the, the standard pulsars on, on the left. And so on the right, you would have the more rapid evolution due to gravitational waves. And then you have this band, which is where they exit the instability window and it's it's shaded to, you know, the shaded region is an estimate of what the uncertainty would be due to the unknown equation of state and mass of the star. This is considering hadronic matter. Uh, and what's interesting is that you see that uh, uh, Mark and Kai here had indicated a system, which is uh, J0537 minus 6910, which is a young X-ray pulsar, which could still be at the end of its um, R mode driven evolution with a reasonably large mode amplitude. And in fact, this is 
a very interesting system in its own right uh, because it's the most frequent glitcher we actually know. It uh, glitches roughly every 100 days and it has rather large and regular glitches, a bit like the, the Vela Pulsar, which we've heard about. Um, but what makes it unique is that it actually has a uh, robust correlation between glitch size and the waiting time uh, until the next glitch. Uh, so here it's, this is rather clear if uh, I haven't got it in the slides here. And it suggests that you, you the glitches are due to some mechanism that happens at some threshold then you have a glitch that moves you away. And the larger the glitch, the longer it's gonna take you to get back to this threshold to have another glitch. And so of course, it's interesting to, to time this system and understand what it's doing. Uh, and one of the things that uh, one can do is look at the braking index. So try to understand what the intrinsic spin down mechanism could be in this system. And of course, one can do it long term as uh, I did, but then you have you know many glitches in, in between if you're trying to do the timing and you're not too sure how to account for this. So another thing one can try is to look at the braking index in shorter segments between glitches and see if far from the glitch you have some asymptotic value of the braking index before the next glitch. Uh, so we did this in uh, 2018 with Niels Anderson and others, and done independently by Ferdman and others. And of course, see, so yeah, it was done again recently by, by Win Ho and collaborators with, with nicer data. And this is a figure you see here. And of course, close to the glitch, things are very messy and you have these very large breaking indices. But then you do seem there is some evidence that say that you go towards an asymptotic value and it's quite interesting is that this isn't close to three as one might maybe expect but it's actually around seven which is what you would get for a constant amplitude r mode that's driving the, the spin evolution so gravitational waves due to r modes because um, you might have heard that for gravitational waves you have an n equals five breaking index this is the case if you have a mountain and emission at twice the rotation frequency if you have uh, R modes with constant amplitude, you have n equals seven. And so this is very interesting because you have this you know, observational hint on the one side, and then from a theoretical point of view, it is possible that the system could actually still be yet in the, you know, in, in the instability window. Um, so this is a scenario, of course, one wants to probe with observations. Uh, the, there was, some, was the first search and gravitational wave data from the first and second observing run of uh, LIGO and Virgo. And uh, this you know, was not quite sensitive enough to uh, really probe this scenario. Now uh, LIGO has uh, had a third observing run. And so of course uh, there's ongoing searches in, in this data. So stay tuned to see what uh, the results these searches uh, will be for this very interesting system. Of course, we can then move on still with the age of the neutron stars. So you know, we've discussed how gravitational waves due to R modes could take you to the standard pulsar population. So what do we think is happening there? Well, at this point, we expect these systems to be R mode stable you could have some deformations of the star and you know we're certain that there is a mechanism that should give you at least a lower limit on the deformation and this is the magnetic field because if, you know, it's well known that magnetic stars will not be spherical you have a field that will deform the star the question is you know how large are these deformations going to be and there have been some models that suggest uh, that if the field is expelled from the superconducting core, then you know, core evolution in the crust will lead to sort of sunspot-like structures that could have you know, locally strong fields, which would lead to quite sizable deformations, so rather large values of uh, epsilon. Uh, on the other hand, we looked at this again uh, recently, again with my student Ankan, 
And if you allow the field to actually thread the superconducting core, then you expect much smaller values for the deformation. The good news here again is that, especially for these scenarios in which you have rather large deformations, we hope that soon searches will be able to actually probe these scenarios. So in the plot that I show you here, which uh, actually comes from a, a review we wrote with, with Kai very recently, what I'm showing you here is this uh, ellipticity, so this measure of the deformation of a neutron star versus gravitational wave frequency. So, and the points, the, the blue points that you see here are the level at which a neutron star would emit if its spin down, observed spin down, would you entirely to gravitational wave emission. So this is what we call the, the spin down upper limit. It's of course an upper limit because we know that these systems are not being spun down entirely by gravitational wave emission. We see the electromagnetic emission. Uh, and so of course, this is kind of a benchmark that we need to, we, our searches need to be more sensitive than this if we hope to uh, detect signals. And uh, you see the, the, the diamonds I've plotted here are already some systems for which uh, in the first part of the third observational run of uh, LIGO and Virgo, the upper limits were below uh, the spin down limit. So the searches are now getting more sensitive and in this region will soon be able to probe some of these uh, scenarios in which you have very large deformations. Now, at this point, I'm going to jump more towards the end of a neutron star's life and discuss uh, how gravitational waves could be relevant in the evolution of recycled uh, systems. Uh, and so in particular, I'm going to focus on low mass X-ray binaries. So we heard a lot about accretion in the previous session of this workshop. And so why did a gravitational waves invoked here? Well, as a solution to, let's say, a kind of observational conundrum, if you will. So the point here is that uh, the fastest known neutron star is spinning at 716 hertz. But we know uh, that actually a neutron star could be spun up to much higher frequencies, in general well above uh, a kilohertz. And so the question is, you know, why don't we actually see any of these uh, neutron stars? And of course, could, there are some selection effects, especially when it comes to the second radio pulsars. But in X-rays, these should be visible if they're, if they're there. And of course, there's many reasons why this could happen, and it could have to do with the, the details of the disk magnetosphere interaction and exactly how the angular momentum is transferred from the disk to the neutron star. But another solution that was suggested early on is that in these systems, you could actually be building a mountain. So your, your accretion is, in, is, it's not, well, you know, it's not a, exactly uh, spherically symmetric. And then if you have a mountain, you have a gravitational wave torque, and eventually you could reach the point where the spin down torque due to gravitational wave balances the spin up torque due to accretion. And the ellipticities that you need are order 10 to the minus seven, which is actually a number that makes sense. Theoretically, it's uh, something that the, the cross of a neutron star could sustain, could be built. And it's interesting that also, if you look at the spin distribution of uh, the accreting millisecond X-ray pulsars, there's some evidence that this could be bimodal, that there's you know, more systems piling up close to this, this, this upper limit for the spin, so that you know, you'd have a slower, widely distributed population, and then this peak. And this, again, could be due to gravitational waves, because if you build a mountain, well, then the spin down torque is scaling like the, the fifth power of the frequency. So in a way, once you go up in frequency, this very steep power law means that you kind of hit a wall after which you're spinning down due to gravitational waves. And so you'd have a pileup of systems near this frequency. And again, this is a scenario that um, makes it interesting to go after these systems um, with 
gravitational wave searches. And uh, here again, I show you a, a plot of the kind of ellipticities that can be probed with current uh, interferometers and, and next generation ones, such as the Einstein telescope. And uh, the stars are the, the level at which you would have torque balance. And of course, for some of these systems, detection would be quite challenging, but there are a few for which, you know, hopefully we can soon really start to say something from uh, observations with like and Virgo. So again, you know, stay tuned and check out what happens. So to go back to the, the theory aspect of things, the question is how would you actually build such a deformation on a neutron star, on an accreting neutron star? And there are actually a few ways to do this. Um, so the first thing is that when you're accreting, you're accreting matter from the companion. So you have this sort of matter formed mostly by light elements that is being pushed down at higher and higher densities. Uh, and at this point, this is not, of course, the, the, the ground state of matter. And so it undergoes several uh, reactions as it gets uh, compressed further, which release heat locally. And this is what leads to uh, this deep crustal heating that reheats um, accreting neutron stars uh, and is consistent with the sort of cooling observations that we have from X-ray transients to so the cooling that happens in quiescence of these systems. And the point is that if this energy release is not exactly spherically symmetric, then again, it will couple to the matter and to the gravitational field and lead to a, to a quadrupole and to gravitational wave mission. And well, we know that things are not going to be uh, spherically symmetric because in most cases we know we have channeled accretion and we have deformations due to the magnetic field. And in fact, the magnetic field itself can, can confine a mountain, right? You accrete matter at the poles and you squash the field. And this leads to a quadrupole in itself, but it also deforms the uh, the actual capture layers and reaction layers in the crust. Uh, and again, this is something we looked at uh, recently with Neha Singh in Warsaw. Uh, and what we found is that you can in fact have quite sizable mountains if you have high accretion rates or higher magnetic fields, or if you have uh, shallow heating layers in uh, at low densities in the neutron star crust as some cooling observations suggest. And this could even be uh, interesting for some specific systems. For example, here I've uh, pointed out J1023, which is uh, one of these transitional uh, pulsars. It's, it's interesting because it, you can time it in x-ray while it's accreting, but then when accretion switches off, it, uh, you have radio emission. And it would appear to be spinning down faster when it's accreting than uh, when it's not. And, emitting radio. And this is interesting because you, know, you sort of naively you might expect the, the, the contrary should be true that you're accreting and so this is you have a, a spin up torque or at least a, a weaker spin down. And so what we suggested with, with Alessandro Paterono uh, and was later also uh, re-elaborated by Bhattacharya is that you, you could be actually building a mountain during accretion that then dissipates when, when accretion uh, stops. And so gravitational waves could have a role to play here. And of course, if this scenario can be verified by timing in following episodes, uh, then again, this could constrain the, the actual reaction layers in the crust using these models. OK, I discussed the mountains. Um, of course, the R modes could also be playing a role in accreting systems, in giving you this, this spin down torque. And the way a system would evolve here is rather different now, because now instead of coming in, let's say from the right, so from the high temperature, high spin region, you'd have a system that is coming in from low temperatures and rotation rates, it's being spun up by accretion and eventually enters the instability curve from the left. So at this point, you now have heating due to the mode eventually cooling balances the heating, you spin down due to gravitational wave emission, re-enter the, the stable region and 
the cycle continues. Now, of course, here, this is just an illustration to understand how it works. Uh, so the, the arrows are exaggerated. Um, but in general, the duty cycle would be quite low. So if you have a system that in which the R mode can grow to very large amplitudes, you would enter well into the unstable region and spin down. But this evolution would be quite fast, so in time scales of maybe months. And then cooling and spinning up again. Well, this is you know accretion time scale, it's millions of years, right? And so you would have to get very lucky to catch a system in the unstable region. On the other hand, calculations suggest that the saturation amplitude is actually fairly small. And so that a mode you know, can't grow so much and the system would basically slide along the instability curve and never make it really far into the unstable region. And so you would never really expect to catch any systems in there. And this is something you can actually go and, and test. So you have your model for the instability window and you can try and populate it with data from the uh, observed increasing millisecond X-ray pulsars. Uh, so this is what's shown here. Uh, and you see that for this simple uh, neutron star model, you would actually have a lot of systems that sit in the instability window. Now, of course, you have to do some work to understand. I mean, you can estimate the frequency, the rotation rate of the systems quite well. If, they, if you see them as pulsars, it's easy, of course, or if you have burst oscillations. The temperature is a bit trickier because I told you you want the, the core temperature. So first, you have to take a spectrum in, in quiescence to get an idea of what the surface temperature of the neutron star is. And then you have to have a model for the outer layers to sort of convert that to a core temperature. And this is what gives you these large error bars, or in some cases, they're just upper limits. But independently, you see that there's a lot of systems in there, and they just shouldn't be there. You, you wouldn't catch them there. So what's so you know this is telling us something fairly simple. It's it's telling us that our plain vanilla neutron star model is is not good enough. We need additional physics in there. And there's two ways out of this. So on the one hand, you could have additional mechanisms that saturate the R mode at very very low amplitude. In this case, well, the system could be R mode unstable, just that the R modes are so tiny that they don't impact at all on the spin or temperature evolution of the star. Or the other possibility is that you know, the, there are other mechanisms in the neutron star that lead to additional uh, viscosity, uh, as Kai was starting to touch upon. And this changes the shape of the instability window and actually makes this region that you see here uh, stable. And so there'd be many uh, suggestions as to what could be going on. There's different possibilities. I'll just show you a couple here. Um, so this is from a, an old paper of mine with Niels Anderson and Greg Comer. There's of course a lot more work you could look at. This is just to get a feel of what could happen. For, for example, if you have hyperons in, in the core of the star, then this will lead to stronger bulk viscosity at lower temperatures, which again could stabilize these systems. If you have uh, quarks in the core, so here you have an example for unpaired quarks, but also Kai has done a lot of work on you know, what could happen if you have a hybrid star, for example. Again, this could lead to effects that stabilize these systems. Or what's, what's interesting, if, well, you know, if we discuss superfluidity a lot, you could have uh, strong neutral friction due to you know, neutron vortices interacting with proton flux tubes in the core. And on the one side, you know, if you have pinning, then this could sort of give you a mechanism to saturate the mode at fairly low amplitudes, because the mode could grow while vortices are pinned to flux tubes. But then as soon as they cut through, then you have very strong damping, and this would kill the mode off. So again, this is quite an interesting possibility if you have these uh, superconducting cores. And finally, uh, to move on to the very last stages of neutron stars life, you know, once you've uh, recycled your pulsar, 
and we can again look in the radio. So if we look at the millisecond radio pulsars, is there any evidence there for uh, gravitational wave emission? And so I'd say yes, uh, because we looked at this recently with Graham uh, Warren and, and others. And it started from uh, a question that uh, Graham was asking, and this was, well, you know, if you look at the PP dot diagram for the millisecond pulsars, the bottom left corner seems awfully empty. You might ask why that is. And of course, it, it's hard to detect uh, very rapidly rotating um, pulsars, and it's uh, of course also very low uh, period derivatives are hard to detect, but you wouldn't expect this kind of power law cut off this way. If anything, you'd expect it maybe to go the other way around, so you would um, really not expect that. And so, we tried to model this in terms of a residual ellipticity of the neutron star to see if this can actually describe what happened. So the idea here would be that if you have an ellipticity, then at some point the neutron star will be spinning down along this, this curve and this will lead to a cutoff as the stars then you know, never make it to the bottom left corner. They just spin down and re-enter the death region. And we found that actually this model uh, fits quite well. So it's uh, get a much better fit if you allow for an ellipticity than, than if you don't, if you just have magnetic uh, spin down. And you find a nice cutoff for an ellipticity of around 10 to the minus nine, which is actually an interesting number because if you remember uh, what I told you that you get for a neutron star with a superconducting core and you know, a surface field of around 10 to the 12 Gauss, then it's exactly a number like this. So it could be the case that you, know, you have a standard pulsar with this kind of ellipticity, and then the external dipole is buried by accretion. So you end up with a, with a, a weaker external field that you infer, but in, in the interior regions, you still have you know, superconducting core, this kind of deformation, which sort of sets a lower limit and could lead to this uh, observed cutoff in, in the PP dot diagram. Okay, so more or less this was a quick went through the whole life of a neutron star and where uh, gravitational waves are relevant. So this is basically all that I wanted to tell you. So I think you know, what we've seen is that probably the, the youngest and the oldest neutron stars are likely to be the most interesting sources of continuous gravitational waves. And as the sensitivity of the gravitational wave searches improves, we actually uh, start to get to the point where we can really think of probing these mechanisms and setting constraints. And in preparation for this, you know, we, we really need to start thinking of more detailed modeling that would allow to, to actually extract informations when we will have uh, detections of this kind of signal. And then, of course, I just showed some possibilities as, you know, many more mechanisms that could be at work. For example, you know, we, we heard about uh, pulsar glitches. You can excite modes of oscillations of the star following a glitch as well. So, you know, you could have F modes excited and you know, there's differing estimates of you know, how strong the signal would be. So it's certainly of interest to, to go after to these kind of signals to do searches close to gl glitches in, in pulsars. And of course, magnetar flares could uh, lead to also different kinds of, of oscillations and, and many more uh, signals. So hopefully in the, in the near future, we'll be able to have many more constraints and really understand what's going on in the high density interiors of these stars. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Ben. Uh, are there any questions to bring? Uh, there's one from Ali Alpar. Is there a correspondence between mountains and then expansion in F modes? Uh, Sorry, I didn't quite hear. A correspondence between mountains and? Uh, between mountains and then expansion in F modes. I don't know if you can see the chat window, but. Uh, okay, maybe. 
But anyway, um, so of course the, the mechanisms don't necessarily exclude each other, right? So um, when we think of mountains, the way we describe them, it's, you know, you think of something that has a rather long, uh, that lasts for longer timescales. Um, of course, it's not, again, in this model, for example, we looked at with Alessandro Patrono, you, you build a mountain and then it will decay on some timescale as, you know, as matter relaxes in the neutron star. Uh, but of course, the same kind of processes that would lead to building the mountain could also lead to excitations of, of different modes. Uh, it really is here, I think, a timescale issue that depends on exactly the, the process you, you have in mind. And also the, the kind of search that, that, that you're doing, this, you know, if this is a lower, you know, the lifetime of the signal is much lower, then you might go for a kind of burst search, while if your mountain gives you a long-lived signal, then you can build up signal to noise by integrating over long time scales, and then these kind of continuous wave searches come into play. Okay, so, uh, Alio just says, I mean mathematically as an expansion in Legendre FNS for F modes uh, or not. Yes. So you want to, um, well, I guess this is, I mean, it's still a, a shape mode, but it's, you know, it's oscillation frequency is, I mean, it has no, it's not oscillating, right? So um, yes. I've never thought of it in, in those terms, but you, I mean, you, you can think of making an expansion, I guess. Okay. Uh, there was another, <coughs> excuse me. I think mathematically the L equals to two and M equals to two F mod can be seen as the same as a mountain. But as Brin said, it's just a matter of time scales that differs them. I guess that's a... Uh... Yeah, because I mean, well, it also depends how you're building the, the mountain and where you're placing this, this, this deformation, right? Um, so those mountains, by the way, let me kind of, uh, would they, so essentially, let's say in these systems, uh, there are some of these systems do show X-ray bursts during their mm -hmm. accretion. So they would, uh, during a burst, they would be disrupted and then uh, at some point, if the outburst, for example, is continuing, would it reform again? Or so, yeah, I mean, the, the question is exactly what's forming it. So if you have these models where you have these deformed capture layers, then you can have some, you know, inbuilt, you, know, you you've started having these reactions. So uh -huh. part of it could be due to composition that stays frozen, but some of it are temperature gradients. And so then you would expect that the mountain could die off on, you know, well, the time scale depends on how deep it is on the time scale it takes mm -hmm. to, the heat to diffuse out and sideways, and then you build it again. Um, of course, if this is happening in quiescence, you could expect to also see a signal, you know, some quadrupolar signal yes. there, just that it's quite, Weak and uh, as far as I know, the sort of limits that you have on this kind of uh, quadrupolar signal are uh, still much higher than the, you know, the the kind of imprint that you would get from the mountain, which is quite small. But in principle, it, it should be there. Because yeah, you're, you're just looking for something at twice the rotation Rotate frequency. frequency. I see. But this would be an L equals m equals two. Of course, you could also have the you know L equals two. M equals one components, etc. Uh, magnetic field. Though, but those kinds of mountains would then have some sort of an effect on the let's say spreading of the burst emission and like uh, those kinds of. I guess that was like. Yeah, I mean, I think here it starts to get significantly more complicated, <laughs> right? Um, right? I guess the. I suppose that you know it, it would play a role because you're building in some asymmetry. So then, yeah. also depending on what the ashes are, you could have different composition. Of course, the first spreading, 
you're mainly interested in the physics of the outer layers. Yes. Uh, the mountains, you, you want to go further down in general, oh, yes. sort of higher density, uh, around maybe starting from say 10 to 10, 10 to the 11 grams per centimeter cubed. So what's happening with the burst would kind of give you an outer boundary condition when you're trying to, oh, to build this, um, which of course is highly relevant. Um, Okay. There's one more comment from Ali Alfard, uh, and the comment for JO537, breaking index must be extracted from data, including many glitches, not just the data between two glitches. Right. I mean, this is what uh, I was saying. So you, what you would, I guess it depends a little bit what you want to look at. So th this has been done, right? There's a paper mm -hmm. by Danai and Tonopoul and others extracting the breaking index, looking long periods, uh, which cover many glitches. Mm -hmm. Of course, the question is, how do you account for this? So here we were just looking at something different. So looking at various periods in between glitches and seeing what happens just before the next glitch. Um, to see if you know, this gives you an idea of something intrinsic that's not, let's say, contaminated by the effect of the glitch itself. Of course, if you know you want to ask the question, what is the, the what you would generally define as the breaking index of this pulsar? Uh, then yes, you. you know, and of course, you get you get a number that's that's actually quite interesting because it's negative. But <laughs> oh my god. But, you know, so this is yeah, the other work that, that I did. All right, then. Uh, are there any other questions to bring? Because if not, we are coming to the end of this whole uh, workshop. I would like to thank very much for all the people attending uh, to the workshop both this week and uh, in the last week. And also, I would like to, of course, thank you very much for all the speakers uh, for like spending the time uh, and all the presentations were very much useful, at least to me. I hope uh, it was useful for, to all of everyone as well. I don't know if there's any comment or discussion, but otherwise, uh, I guess we came to the end of the workshop. Dear Tolga, we are very happy to see you in our workshop. We thank all speakers and participants. All right. Thank you very much, then. Uh, thank you very much, Green, one more time to, and to the all, all of the speakers. Thank you. Uh, see you some other <laughs> teleconference, I guess. All right. Thanks. <laughs>